Hi, good evening everyone. So, welcome to our recall session of yesterday's NEET PG 2022 paper. We will be discussing uh, the OBS and GYNI part of it. I am Dr. Rena Chavla. I have my own classes by the name of OBG classes by Dr. Rena. You can find me on Instagram and on YouTube. I am also senior faculty with Docomy. So, uh, if you want to listen to more interesting lectures uh, like this, you can subscribe to our channel. So let's quickly do a brief analysis of the NEET PG yesterday's exam. So, uh, as usual, uh, the past year also we've had lots and lots of OBG questions. Even the recent INICT also had lots and lots of OBG questions. So, that basically implies that OBG is a very, very important subject. Let me just get my pen in order. Just a second. Yeah. Okay. So, OBG is a very, very important topic and many of you find it tricky, many of you find it difficult. But this time the exam, the level of difficulty was actually moderate with a lot of easy questions also. But majority of them were moderate. They definitely were some tricky ones. A lot of uh, um, uh, distractors which were tricky. Okay, so um, yes, all in all it wasn't. I wouldn't say it was a very easy paper with respect to OBS and Gaini. It was moderate. Okay, it's very similar to last year's paper. But the topics from where the, to the, the the topics where the questions came from were all expected topics. You had a lot of uh, questions from uh, ectopic pregnancy or contraception and preeclampsia, eclampsia. These are expected topics. Okay, there's a list mullerian anomalies which came in last uh, NEET PG also. So that was again expected this time. So lots and lots of uh, high yield topics, lots and lots of clinical scenarios, and this was throughout the paper. The, the entire paper had, I think. More than 50% were clinical scenarios and uh, around 60% were actually images. There were lots and lots of many images. A lot of them were irrelevant images. Actually, the question didn't require the image. But yeah, in OBS and Gynae, I think there were six images. But overall, there were uh, 70 plus images in the entire paper. So images and clinical scenarios now form the basis of most of the questions. And that's what has become um, important for uh, need PG exams and remember that the clinical scenarios although take a little more time but they're actually quite simple once you get the gist of it they're actually quite simple to do and images of course you need to need to practice lots and lots of images to get to understand them and again uh, so there were previous year questions were there uh, many of you may feel they weren't they were actually but more of them were quite indirect um, they were uh, less of direct repeat exact recalls but yeah so from the same topic like last year there was a neat pg question on uh, there was a image based question on unicornial uterus this year the same hsg picture but a different uh, mullerian anomaly so that's how it was a little different but if you revise previous year questions you know your high yield topics and you can answer most questions related to that topic then okay so let's now quickly start so let's start with a few image-based questions. Identify the type of hymen. Okay. Now, is this a septate, semilunar, angular, or cribriform? And the correct answer is a septate. You can actually clearly see. I think in the actual exam, the, 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 it was a little asymmetrical. Okay. But it was uh, septa was definitely there in the middle. Okay. This doesn't have much of clinical importance. Okay. I don't know why it was asked. But yeah. So this could, you can even say this was from anatomy. But um, um these are the different types of hymen. This is an annular hymen or ring shape. This is a gribiform hymen. This is a septate hymen, what came in the exam. So different, different types of hymen, okay? And this is very straightforward, nothing much to this, okay? Next question, which is a contraindication to this? Okay, so this is, what is this? This is a intrauterine device, a copper containing intrauterine device. Which, ex which device is exactly is it? It's the multi-load 375, okay? So basically, they're asking you what is a contraindication to a copper-containing intrauterine device? Is it menstruation? Is it trophoblastic disease? Is it condom rupture during intercourse? Or is it following delivery? So let's start from backwards. Following delivery, yes. Okay, what is called as post-placental IUCD insertion, which is encouraged a lot these days. Within 10 minutes of delivery of the placenta, we insert this. So, yes, following delivery, yes, even after 48 hours, we can insert the property. Condom rupture during intercourse would become then, we would the woman would come looking for emergency contraception. And a copper containing IUCD is actually a very good option for emergency contraception. Up till 120 hours or 5 days, we can insert the intrauterine device following such a problem. Okay. 
so emergency contraception yes it can be used trophoblastic disease no it is an absolute contraindication and that is why this is the correct answer menstruation so yes it, 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 we don't really put it during the period we don't really insert it during the period we do, do it to call the patient after she has uh, she's done with her period then we insert it but if you see amongst the all the options this is not a absolute contraindication okay it's not even a relative contraindication it can be put it's just uncomfortable for the patient the chances of expulsion are higher but the correct answer is trophoblastic disease what are the other absolute contraindications to copper containing intrauterine devices pregnancy of course unexplained vaginal bleeding she's bleeding you don't know the cause gestational trophoblastic disease as we just discussed then all the three genital cancers cervical cancer endometrial cancer ovarian cancer and the presence of an infection a sexually transmitted infection or pelvic inflammatory disease these are all absolute contraindications to copper containing iod remember contraception is a very very important topic it's a very high yield topic always a contraceptive question on contraception is expected because it's very uh, it's a very important topic otherwise when it comes to government of india uh, guidelines and um, as a country india we contraception is a much required uh, thing that's why it becomes important Okay, next question. Following delivery, the placenta is being removed by traction on the structure shown. So, what structure is this? This is the cord. So, this traction is being put on the cord. So, this is basically controlled cord traction is being done in the third stage of labor. This is how we deliver the placenta. The structure snaps. So, what happened? The cord snaps now. And that is profuse bleeding. What is the next step in management? So, once the cord snaps, it becomes difficult to get a hold on the placenta. It becomes difficult to deliver the placenta otherwise. But we have to remove the placenta. So, what do we do next? Okay, oxytocin. So, oxytocin would have already been given. If you remember, active management of third stage of labor, the first thing we do is we give oxytocin 10 minutes IM or IV. Otherwise, also you may think she's bleeding, so you want to give her oxytocin. But remember, by giving oxytocin, you will be closing the internal os also. You won't be able to deliver the placenta. So, the first thing we need to do is deliver the placenta and then start your oxytocin. Okay, uterine massage won't help in any way till the placenta is out. Arranged blood and Creed's method. Arranged blood, yes, obviously you will do because she's bleeding profusely. But what is Creed's method? Creed's method is an obsolete method. It was. It's basically um, uh, uh, removing the placenta without taking this, these precautions. It's just sort of pushing on the fundus of the uterus and pulling the cord out. So this suprapubic pressure is not given, and this this would lead to a lot of uterine inversions. So it is not done anymore. Remember this. So the correct answer is manual removal of placenta. Next question. A 59-year-old woman presents with anogenital warts. Genotyping of the virus is done and it shows her to be at risk for atypia or squamous cell carcinoma. What is the likely genotype? So, it's basically asking you high-risk HPV is which, which of these is a high risk and this was also a straightforward answer. We know HPV 16, 18 are the highest, the most common high-risk types and this was the correct answer. These are the rest are all low risk okay so remember what so hpv is again a question which comes in every paper be it ini be it um, an pg it repeatedly comes because it's sort of uh, a very important area again especially when it comes to cervical cancer so these are the high risk types okay 16 18 as i said is the most common um, uh, cause of uh, uh, cervical cancer apart from the other ones 31 33 35 39 all those okay these are probable high risk and these are low risk okay so remember 6 and 11 are low risk and they are the ones which generally cause these warts okay so benign low grade um, abnormalities in the cervix or laryngeal papillomas or cutaneous um, or genital warts are caused by 6 and 11 okay but infection of the high risk types are what we're worried about and these can cause cancer okay and what cancers can they cause they can cause cervical cancer anal cancer oropharyngeal cancer vaginal cancer and penile cancer so this is what you need to know of course there's so much more about hpv but we won't go into too much details okay but this is uh, important from what came Next question. So we're just finishing the images, image-based ones, I think, in the beginning, then we'll move on. So identify the plain colored green. So identify the spaces of maternal pelvis, and they basically asked, what is this plane? So this plane is the plane, is it the plane of the outlet? So the where is the outlet? This is the outlet. Okay, so you see this pelvis, this is the outlet. So it's not the outlet, it's neither the anatomical outlet nor the obstetrical outlet. Is it the inlet? Okay, where will the where do you think the inlet will be? This would be the inlet. Is it the inlet? No, it's not the inlet. So, what is the correct answer? This was a very easy question. It was a plain or mid cavity. Normally, you would expect difficult questions on pelvis and skull. This is one of the easiest questions which came. Okay, and this is the plane of the mid cavity. 
now let's just understand a bit more so this is a similar uh, this is the inlet you can see this plane is the inlet this one and this one okay these are both the mid cavity this is the plane of the greatest dimension that is the biggest space in the pelvis and this is the plane of the least dimension that is the smallest space in the pelvis and this is the outlet okay so so if you see this diagram this diagram this is easily the mid cavity now the plane of the inlet to go into a bit more detail what do you find anteriorly you find the superior margin posterior superior margin of the pubic symphysis and what you find posteriorly you will find the promontory sacral promontory and the ala of the sacrum on the sides and on the uh, margins you'll find the laterally you'll find the iliopectineal lines that is the border of the inlet plane of inlet what is the border of the mid cavity you have the plane of greatest dimension again you have anteriorly the pubic symphysis here okay laterally you have the upper and middle thirds of the operator foramen here's the operator foramen you can see it here okay and posteriorly you have s2 s3 okay so remember plane of greatest dimension is at the level of s2 s3 plane of least dimension is the level of s4 s5 and remember plane of least dimension is at the level of the ischial spines remember where the head gets stuck most often we have a question on dta also so this is the plane plane of least dimension this is where most obstructions happen this is where more arrest most arrests happen they can ask you in the next exam where is the, which is the plane where most arrests or most details happen or where where uh, uh, arrest of descent happens this is at the plane of the least dimension why because it has least uh, um, area so that's why the head gets stuck there and what is the plane of outlet so plane of outlet anteriorly we have the subcubic angle here Okay, posteriorly we have if it is if we're taking the anatomical plane we have the coccyx the tip of the coccyx but if we're taking the obstetrical plane we have so when when the head is pushing here down it the sacrococcygeal joint is mobile it will move the sacrococcygeal joint piece posteriorly and this would be the plane so this is the obstetrical outlet so it's either here this is the anatomical outlet this is the obstetrical outlet the actual outlet with which the through, through which the fetus passes okay and of course on the lateral parts you have the bitubulus diameter or the ischial tuberosities on either side so these are the planes okay and uh, pelvis and skull is a very again a very important area from which questions do repeatedly come from okay so now moving on to the next question a 35 year old man so this is actually a question from pathology but a lot of questions came which were integrated so i just tried to pick out the relevant obs and gynae questions and go take it from there so a 35 year old man who is undergoing evaluation for infertility semen analysis shows azoospermia okay so what we what was done next a testicular biopsy was done and this image was seen what is the diagnosis is it a germ cell tumor is it a sertoli only cell tumor is it a testicular atrophy or is it orchitis now the most most confusion was between these two okay is it sertoli only cell syndrome or is it testicular atrophy and the correct answer this is sertoli only cell syndrome okay so in an only sertoli cell syndrome which is seen here so we don't see germ cells okay germ cells are absent we don't see spermatozoa okay and this oh, this lining of only sertoli cells here around here is called a wind swept appearance there are absent germ cells and there is very lower absent spermatogenesis and these patients are typically normal on examination and diagnosis is made on the testicular biopsy finding so there's absence of germ cells which is characteristic and this picture here the the sertoli, sertoli cells are arranged like this. this is called a wind swept appearance this is testicular atrophy okay so testicular atrophy will have this thickening of the basement membrane okay so thickening of the basement membranes will be seen okay there'll be a lot of fibrosis in between again spermatozoa will not be seen but germ cells will be seen okay so this is a little difficult question i guess a little tricky okay but this is now that you this has come you should know this is how sertoli cell only syndrome looks like okay again a tricky question okay i'll call it tricky because many of you are getting confused with this it's actually not very tricky if you come to think about it a 28 year old woman who delivered 18 months back and is breastfeeding so she delivered one and a half years back okay and she seeks contraceptive advice now the next question holds the clue her periods are irregular and heavy they're irregular and they're heavy so the best contraceptive for her would be what okay would it be would it be what is progesterone cert it is a it is a progesterone containing intrauterine device like Mirina, right? What is NETEN? It is a monthly progesterone. So it's a progesterone in injection. So it's contain, contain, it contains nordestrone enantiate. That's why it's called NETEN. What is Mala N? We all know this is a combined OC pill. And what is Copper T380A? It is basically the 10-year IUCD, which is recommended by the government of India. 
Now see what she has. She has two issues. Number one, she is breastfeeding. Number two, she is having irregular and heavy periods. Now is this breastfeeding significant? Okay, she her baby is one and a half years old. So what is the recommendation for combined OC pills in breastfeeding? The recommendation is it can be given but only after breastfeeding has been established. So it's usually contraindicated in the first six months only. After that, once breastfeeding is established, it does not affect the quantity or quality of breast milk. Only when it, the woman is trying to establish breastfeeding and that's why it is not given in the first six months. But after that, breastfed women can be given, I mean, women who are breastfeeding can be given oral combined oral contraceptive periods and that will also solve her issue of her irregular and heavy bleeding. Her periods will become regular and the bleeding will become less. Because if you give progester cert, what will happen? Her irregular periods will persist, okay? And if you give any TN, the same thing, her irregular periods will persist. You're not helping her in any way. And with copper T, her heavy bleeding will increase, okay? So this A, B and B will not solve her problem. Combined OC pills is the answer because breastfeeding, so this is there to trick you, okay? Remember that. So less than six months woman, you cannot give o combined OC pills. If she's delivery has been more than six months, yes, you can give combined OC pills. Remember this, all right? So it's not a it's not a blank absolute contraindication. So always remember when you're reading contraception, go through the WHO MEC criteria, okay? Which says if it's cat category one, you can safely give whatever contraceptive there is. If it is category two, you can give, but the benefits outweigh the risks. Three is the risks outweigh the benefits, and four is you can't give. It's absolute contraindication. So for easy, so if it's one or two, you can give. And if it's three or four, you basically can't give, okay, in simpler words. So if you see breastfeeding and combined oral contraceptives, after six months, they come under category two. So that means you can give combined oral contraceptives in women who are breastfeeding. Okay, next question. Okay, so this also is an, a nice interesting question. I think most of you got this right. A 22-year-old primary gravida is overdue by two weeks. She visits the OPD with complaints of vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain on the right side. On examination, her vitals are stable. Abdominal examination is unremarkable. A bimanual examination reveals a bulky soft uterus with no tenderness and no adnexal mass. Okay. Mild bleeding is seen. Beta HCG is 1400. An ultrasound reveals a trilaminar endometrium and both the adnexa are normal. So what is the next best step? So here we have a young primary gravita who has come with a, a bleeding and pain. Okay bleeding and pain but she's quite stable and on examination you find nothing of particular uh, significance but you find her beta HCG is 1400 okay and the ultrasound is normal nothing is seen on the ultrasound so when you have a UPT positive that means the beta HCG is there but nothing is seen on the scan okay what is that called it is called as pregnancy of undetermined location so there she is pregnant but we don't know what it is we don't know where it is Okay, it could be a failing intrauterine pregnancy, it could be a failing ectopic pregnancy, it could be a growing ectopic pregnancy. We really don't know. So, we have to investigate further. And how do we do that? We do that by repeating a serum beta HCG after 48 hours. Because what will happen if we repeat a beta HCG after 48 hours? If it is an intrauterine growing pregnancy, it should increase by more than 60%. That is what is called as doubling time. Okay, doubling is a misnomer. The increase should be more than 60%. So if I do a beta HCG, her beta HCG is 1400 and if it's a growing intrauterine pregnancy after 48 hours, the beta HCG should now be more than 60%. That should, that is, it should be at least 3000 and above. Okay, then we know yes, it is an intrauterine growing pregnancy. Okay, also there's something called the discriminatory zone. That is at a value of 1500 beta HCG, serum beta HCG, we should be able to see an intrauterine sac on the TVS. And at a value of around 6000, we should be able to see an intrauterine sac on our abdominal scan. Okay, so it's 1400, that's why probably we're not seeing anything. So it could be a completely normal pregnancy. It could be an ectopic pregnancy. It could be threatened abortion. It could be complete abortion. It could be a failing intrauterine pregnancy. It could be anything. Okay, but how do we know? So what do we do in the management of pregnancy of undetermined location? The first thing we do is we repeat a serum wet beta HCG after 48 hours. So patient comes with positive UPT plus pain plus bleeding. What do we do? 
if she is stable, she could be stable or unstable. If she is unstable, we obviously it's like topic pregnancy. We offer surgical management. If she is stable, we do a transvaginal scan to see where the pregnancy is or what is the cause of bleeding. So it could be an intrauterine pregnancy. Okay, it could be an ectopic pregnancy. So you may see an ectopic pregnancy in the scan. You may see an intrauterine pregnancy. In both cases, you are sorted. You know what to do now next, right? The problem comes. When we don't see anything, so it is non-diagnostic or a pregnancy of undetermined location, and herein lies the role of serum beta HCG at zero zero hours and at forty eight hours. So this is why this is a very very important algorithm. It's a very important topic. It's come in the past also. It's expected to come in the future. So understand the concept of pregnancy of undetermined location. We know she's pregnant. We just don't know where the pregnancy is. It might be very early. It might be an ectopic. So how do we do? What do we do next? We do a serum beta HCG and we repeat it after forty eight hours. Next question. Oh, this is also a little a uh, weird uh, question, and I don't really know what the examiner was getting at with this. A patient at twenty two weeks presents with profuse vaginal bleeding. Her BP and sugars were normal. Again, I don't know why this point was mentioned. The likely site of implantation is is it ovarian, tubal, at the internal nos or abdominal? Now, please remember, ovarian and tubal will never reach twenty two weeks. They will rupture much, much, much before. Okay. So usually they rupture by maximum eight to ten weeks. So it's very impossible, next to impossible for them to reach so high. Abdominal can reach. Okay, in fact, abdominal pregnancies have even been reported to go till term, but they won't present with profuse vaginal bleeding. She may have a little bit of spotting because of shedding residue, but the placenta is implanted outside in the abdomen. Okay, it's seeking its uh, vasculature vessels, uh, vessels, uh, blood supply from other organs. So there's no way of abdominal pregnancy. Usually bleeds. Okay, so this is also out. Internal loss. So I think here what they were trying to say is a low lying placenta. That means a placenta implanted in the lower segment. What will eventually present as placenta previa after the period of viability. So a placenta implanted in the intern near the internal loss or low lying placenta is typically how such a patient would present. So that's why this should be the correct answer. Okay, next question. Again, a nice big clinical scenario given, and then they ask a very simple question. Okay, so a 39-year-old gravida two para one presents at 18 weeks five days for her routine targeted fetal anomaly scan. The fetal anatomy appears normal, but the cervical length is 15 millimeter. Okay, so 15. The cervical length is less. Despite being counseled that there is no clear proven benefit for the same, the patient insisted on a cervical cerclage. Which of the following is a complete contraindication to circular? So they're basically saying which of the following is completely contraindicated to circular? Okay, is it a positive fetal fibronectin? Is it membranes bulging into the vagina? Is it ruptured membranes or is it advanced with unlaced? She's thirty-nine years old. The correct answer is you will never ever put a circular if the membranes are ruptured. It is only put when the membranes are intact. In all the other conditions, you can do membranes bulging into the vagina is technically difficult to do, okay? Because if you reduce the membranes with a sponge on a sponge holder, a gauze on a sponge holder, we gently reduce the membranes and then take the stitch, and usually it tends to tear through because the cervix is now dilated. But it still can be done. It's called an emergency circlage. Okay, the rest are also indicated. So, what are the absolute contraindications for circlage? It is poliomyelitis, ruptured membranes, current bleeding. If she's bleeding, you can't put a stitch. If she's getting active contractions, if she's more than four centimeter dilated, you are just going to be cutting through the cervix. The cervix can't close. Okay, and if there's a the baby is not alive, obviously there's no point doing a circlage. Okay, again, easy question. G three P two L two seven weeks for termination of pregnancy by medical methods. What is CAC guidelines? Comprehensive abortion care guidelines. What do we use? So the government of India has said you have to use MIFI. So MIFI was there in all the choices. MIFI is R U four eighty six. It is an anti progestin. Okay, and with this we give mesoprostol. So this is the correct answer. What is mesoprostol? It is prostaglandin E one. So remember, anti-progestin mifepristone is given for 200 milligram orally, followed 48 hours later by 600 microgram of PGE1 or mesoprostol. Okay, next question. 34-year-old primary with jaundice and a BP of 140 by 90. So her blood pressure was raised. 
Her investigation, see her serum bill is, bill is slightly raised, SGOT is raised, SGPT is raised. Normally, the values, the val normal value is 40. Anything more than 72 becomes significant. Her LDH is raised. Normal LDH is still 600. So, LDH of 700 is raised. And her platelet count is less. Okay. Also, remember her KFT and coagulation were normal. And this is important because it helps us rule out one of the conditions here. Okay. So, what is this? It's very, very clear. Blood pressure high. Hemolysis is there. So, whenever LDH is raised, LDH is raised because the, when red cells are destroyed, they release LDH. So, hemolysis, in the presence of hemolysis, LDH will be raised. So, we have hemolysis, we have elevated liver enzymes and we have low platelet count. So, this is classic health syndrome. Why is it not AFLP? Because her coagulation is normal, her KFT is normal. Okay, although AFLP does present at this gestation, it does present many times with hypertension. But in AFLP, her bilirubin would have been much higher, her liver enzyme would have been much higher. Okay, of the order of 500 to 1000. In viral hepatitis, the liver enzyme would be in thousands. Okay, that's why it's not viral hepatitis. Okay, bilirubin also would have been much, much higher. Okay, and intrahepatic cholesterol pregnancy, it is not there because. Uh, SGOT, SGPT, yes, are raised, but none of the other features would be seen in this. What would have been seen would have, would have been a bile acid. A serum bile acid raised would have been seen in this case. Okay. Next question. A 34-year-old G2P1 presents at 35 weeks. She has no complaints and is appreciating fetal movements well. She had a previous classical cesarean. So, remember this. Okay. So, many of you missed this point. Classical cesarean and 25 weeks for eclampsia and severe growth restriction. She is currently on low dose aspirin and prenatal vitamins. On examination, the uterus, the spicer fungal height is 38 cm. Fetal heart is okay. The ultrasound reveals a fetus in breach. Placenta posterior amniotic fluid normal. The patient desires a vaginal delivery. What is the best management? Okay, so now see the only clinching thing, such a long case scenario, it goes it goes on about everything. You you would think breach is important, but what is most important is the previous classical cesarean. Okay, whenever you have a patient the previous classical, whatever else it be, you will deliver her by a repeat cesarean section. Please remember this, the chance of rupture is very, very high, up to 4 to 9% if you allow her to deliver vaginally. So, even after 2 weeks, if you do a scan and has turned to cephalic, it doesn't matter. I still won't give her a trial of labor after cesarean section. I will still schedule an elective LSCS at 37 weeks because of the previous classical section. If she was previous LSCS and this baby turns to cephalic, maybe I would have uh, um, given a trial of labor, but not now. Okay, the others are out of the question. ECV not done because of the previous classical section. Await spontaneous labor, obviously, internal blood vision, of course, you won't do this. And review scan after two weeks. Why not? I'm saying because it doesn't matter if the baby turns now. Okay, you will do a repeat LSCS. Primary at 40 weeks, she has been in labor for three hours. Which of the following will determine she's in active labor? What is active labor? Okay, we all know active labor now by the new WHO definition is more than 5 cm. And this question has come because the new labor care guide, which is the next generation partograph, says the onset of active labor is after 5 cm. In my high yield topic uh, uh, discussion, I had mentioned this. That labor care guide is very important. It can come and that's why this is the correct answer. Okay. So, contractions will be there, of course, for the cervix to dilate. Head, this is not, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. The only way to diagnose active labor is a dilatation of more than 5 cm. It used to be 4 cm. ACOG says more than 6 cm. So, Williams gives more than 6 cm. The WHO says 5 cm and this has been used for the purpose of the labor care guide, which is the next generation photograph. Expect questions from this topic now onwards. Okay. A multi is in the second stage of labor since two hours with good uterine contractions. On examination, the head is one fifth palpable. Again, this was a tricky question. Okay, and I'll tell you why it was tricky. So, a multi gravita, remember this point? Okay, on examination, the head is one fifth palpable. Fetal heart is good. On vaginal examination, the cervix is fully dilated. The head is at the ischial spines in ROT position. Caput is plus plus. Molding is plus plus. How will you deliver her? Okay, so first of all, what is this? This is deep transverse arrest. All right, what is deep transverse arrest? It is basically when the head is stuck in the transverse position, that is the sagittal which is in the transverse plane, okay, and for more than an hour with good uterine, despite good uterine contractions, the cervix 
the patient the, the further descent is not happening because what happens in DTA internal rotation is not happening why is it not happening because either there is CPD or it happens very commonly in grand multis where the levator ani is very lax okay and hence for internal rotation to happen, there should be something pushing from above and resistance from below. So when that happens, internal rotation happens. So here the baby is getting stuck either because there is CPD or because there is a weak levator in it. Okay. And that is the definition of DTA. So one more than one hour, get stuck in transverse position despite good uterine contractions, despite full dilatation. Okay. Nothing further is happening. So what will you do? Okay. Now here, please remember, okay. If it was a primary gravita or if there are features of obstruction, the answer should be emergency LSCS. Okay. And why uh, why am I a bit confused with this question? So this question was a bit confusing to me also. And I'll tell you why. Because if it was a primary gravita, I would have definitely marked emergency LSCS. But here we've given a question with a multi-gravita. And apart from 2 plus caput and 2 plus molding, which is not exactly uh, um, pathognomonic of obstruction. Okay, again, if it was obstruction, the answer would be emergency LS. So, in the event of a primary or in the event of obstructed labor, you will do an emergency LS, yes. But if it is a multi gravida, we know her pelvis has been tested, she's delivered before, the cause just may be a weak levator in eye. In that case, we can either do a vacuum. Or if very experienced, you can use a high rotational forceps, what is called as key lance forceps. So mid cavity is wrong because for mid cavity rotation needs to be complete. A oh, wait one more one more hour is wrong because otherwise you will end up in trouble. She's already been in labor for two hours. That is the upper limit for a multi. Vacuum is where now I am a little confused. Okay, so this question for me is controversial mainly because. It is a multi gravita the cause could be a weak levator ni and a vacuum delivery can be done in DTA in the case of multi gravita okay so vacuum has the property of causing rotation okay so rotation is not a problem okay and the pelvis is anyway adequate okay but if you consider caput plus plus and molding plus plus as signs of obstruction then the answer is emergency lscs so i would go with 60 40 60 percent emergency lscs 40 percent vacuum and I'm still trying to find out more references for this question. I've discussed with many, many obstetricians, many senior uh, faculty in uh, uh, medical colleges and it's sort of a little confusing this question. Okay, so it's either emergency LSCS or vacuum but more in favor of, of uh, cesarean because caput plus plus and molding plus plus. What is deep transverse arrest? Good uterine contractions, head at zero station, such items within the transverse diameter for more than one hour if there's no progress. So all these should be fitting to call it as DTA. What do you do if it is a primary or if there are features of obstruction directly cesarean? But if she's a multi, okay, you can, apart from a cesarean, you can also try a vacuum or rotational forceps. Okay, so I hope this is a little clear, although I need to look up more references for this question. Next question, easy question. Collapse in a patient during labor or delivery followed by bleeding and DINC in the absence of coexisting conditions is most likely due to, okay, and the answer is amniotic fluid embolism. So, sudden postpartum collapse in a woman who is otherwise all right and usually this happens after ARM or starting oxytocin, okay, and happens during labor or in the second stage of labor once the baby has just come out, patient suddenly uh, goes into cardiovascular collapse, okay, this is because amniotic fluid enters the circulation and that causes amniotic fluid embolism. Postpartum hemorrhage, no, and otherwise, okay, so she's collapsed and then she bleeds, no. So in PPH, she'll first bleed and then she'll collapse because of the hemorrhagic shock. Eclampsia, no, there are no seizures. Peripartum myopathy does not present like this usually. It presents usually after delivery, a month within a month of delivery, the patient will not have sudden cardiovascular collapse. She will have symptoms before she goes into cardiac failure, okay. What is AFE? It is a serious intrapartum complication caused by amniotic fluid entering the circulation in case of hypotension, shock and collapse. It has a very, very high mortality and it happens in low risk patients. If it happens, it gives a very big shock to both the doctor and the patient. So it, it, it's very sad, uh, but yes, it does happen. And risk factors, as I said, following an ARM, following oxytocin, multiple pregnancies, it is seen more common in this group. Suspected diagnosis, it's always a suspected diagnosis, it is always confirmed on autopsy when you find presence of fetal squamous cells in the maternal pulmonary circulation and the management is resuscitation, oxygenation and correction of coagulopathy.
right next question a 22 year old type 1 diabetic is in the post operative ward following a cesarean done for failed induction so she had a cesarean for failed induction the indication for induction was preeclampsia with severe features so she was basically a patient of severe preeclampsia who underwent induction and then had a cesarean for failed induction she is also type 1 diabetic she now complains of drowsiness and altered sensorium so she is in the post op period complaining of drowsiness altered sensorium she is on maintenance magnesium sulfate infusion so she is probably uh, presuming that she was started on prophylactic maxalt to prevent eclampsia and now she is on the maintenance infusion which is usually given at 1 gram per hour okay according, according to the zuspan regime and on iv infusion of insulin now what do what happens on examination her pulse is 70 so pulse is okay bp is slightly high respiratory rate is 10 so that's less auscultation of the lungs reveals bilateral normal air entry abdominal examination reveals a firm uterus with normal tenderness pharyngeal scar is intact and there is no significant vaginal bleeding so operatively doesn't look like there's a problem right bilateral patellar reflexes are absent and why were reflexes checked because whenever a patient is on magnesium sulfate we check three things when while she's on the infusion or while she's on the maintenance dose we check for respiratory rate we check for by uh, uh, the sorry uh, the pat pat patellar reflex and we check for the urine output a urine dipstick for protein and sugar is negative and i think also output mentioned here was given output was less in this question and the capillary glucose sample is 270 mg per cent what is the suspected diagnosis is it magnesium toxicity so two things that come to your mind are these two because she's severe preeclampsia and she's on magnesium sulfate the second thing you think of is diabetic ketoacidosis these are anyway out and this answer was magnesium toxicity because very classical presentation what happens the reflexes initially go absent then respiratory depression happens and then the patient becomes comatose Neuro neurological effects happen so what should we do we should immediately stop the magnesium because clinical magnesium toxicity is there so how will you manage next time the question can, can come on management what should you do you should stop the magnesium send magnesium levels okay a send serum magnesium to monitor monitor the levels and what is the antidote give her calcium gluconate okay so this is the treatment that this is how you will treat this patient okay next question which of the following will you see long bone fractures in the fetus on antenatal scan will you see it in marfan's osteogenesis imperfecta achondroplasia or platinism and the answer is oi osteogenesis imperfecta and when i saw this question which uh, when i uh, got to this question had come i was very happy and why because uh, if you those of you who are fond readers if you read this book by jodi pickolt handy handle with care and she's a brilliant author you should read her books okay so this book was about a little girl okay um, um i forgotten her name i think her name was uh, i forgotten her name okay so she had she was born with osteogenesis imperfecta and this girl's mother sued her obstetrician friend who Who, who delivered her basically because she felt she had missed the diagnosis on the antenatal ultrasound okay and the doctor was actually her best friend so it's just a it was a very very emotional book and uh, i read this many many years back which is reading this question immediately reminded me of this and i had to put it here for those who are interested now you're on your break those who are you of you are avid readers please pick up this book it's a brilliant read okay spectrum of the, so what is osteogenesis imperfecta so it is a spectrum of defects characterized by fragile bones and it's their type 1 to type 8 and i think most of you this is not a obs and guide topic but i'm just telling you uh, so type 1 is the mildest form type 2 is the most severe and what do you see on the antenatal ultrasound you see fractures of long bones or other bones also but characteristic this is a femur you can see a fracture this is a humerus you can see a fracture and also there is hypomineralization of the skull so the white dense white skull which you see will now not be dense white okay i didn't get a good picture so i didn't post it here okay it will be slightly lesser in less white than what is normally seen so hypomineralization of the fetal skull so these two hypomineralization of the fetal skull and fractures of long bones are what is seen when you read this book you will you will immediately uh, uh, you will understand uh, it is all about antenatal diagnosis of osteogenesis imperfecta nice question this was okay next question a g2 p1 l1 presents at 28 weeks on examination the uterus is 24 weeks on ultrasound there is absent lichen which could be the most likely cause 
okay so this again is a relatively straightforward question it's a previous year question okay uh, so what happens when there is absent liquor in the in, uh, in the second trimester think of renal anomalies because after all what is liquor liquor is urine the baby which passes urine that is the main source of amniotic fluid so think of renal anomalies when amniotic fluid is absent in the mid trimester what can this lead to this can lead to potter's facies okay where you have a flattened nose facial defects limb defects so that's because there's no space and when the baby comes out it will have pulmonary hypoplasia okay so uh, this is the correct answer congenital heart disease usually if at all maybe associated with polyhydramnios if the baby goes into heart failure tf definitely polyhydramnios hydrocephalus again there is no real relation unless there are other anomalies so the answer for this is the is fetal renal anomalies this was an easy question okay so this is where i was saying last year what came last year uh, i think uniconvert uterus came in eight pg hsg picture and this year what has come to so remember uh, hsg is not a good modality actually to differentiate between septate and biconvert this is obviously not uniconvert it is obviously not didelphus because there there is one cervix seen okay so it's either septate or biconvert and on hsg is not a good modality the best modality is to is to do a 3d ultrasound or an mri okay but this is what we were given so given and this was i think this is this is a similar picture to what was given but what i heard was that the angle was less than 70 degree this angle between the two corner if it was less than 70 degree the answer should be a septate uterus if it is more than 100 degrees the answer should be a biconvert now you can figure out yourself what the angle was but from what most of the information i have gathered it was a septate uterus okay so that is that should be the answer but i've explained to you what you should look for in the hsg so let's quickly just see so in biconvert uterus the hsg demonstrates separate fusiform uterine horns and the intercorneal angle is more than 105 right like here you can see the angle here is obtuse okay and this is a this one is a uh, ignore this this is this is the spill of the dye this is the uterus okay here you can see here so here the angle is less than 70 okay so it's mostly a septate uterus so v shaped configuration so right whenever you see a v that is a septate okay whenever you see something like this it is a biconvert okay so this is another way you can remember but as i said the best way is a 3d scan okay here i put a picture of didelphus and this was the last neat pg uniconvert uterus okay and but the best way see this these are 3d ultrasound so what you do in a 3d ultrasound you draw a line between the two endometrial cavities you see these two white things this is the endometrial cavities so you join them by drawing a line okay like here like here and then you join a line at the top the fundal contour you join a line here and you measure the distance between the fundal contour and the top of the endometrial cavities if this distance is less than 2 mm or it's crossing through it is a biconvert uterus but if this distance is more then it is a septate uterus so this is another way on 3d scan how you can differentiate between and this is obviously the best way and of course confirmatory if someone asks how will you confirm the diagnosis it is always by a laprohistro by a diagnostic laparoscopy hysteroscopy is the confirmatory diagnosis okay the investigation of choice for molecular anomalies is a 3d ultrasound so hsg is actually very poor the sensitivity of hsg in differentiating biconvert and uniconvert biconvert septate is actually only about 50% So this question should not have been there, but since it's come, if it's V, it's a septate. If the um, if it's something like this, it's a biconvert. Next question. Okay, thirty-four year old woman is advised an ultrasound Doppler and a double marker between eleven to fourteen weeks. Doppler of the umbilical artery helps predict what? Late onset preeclampsia, early onset preeclampsia, FGR or placenta vitae. And the answer here is early onset. So remember, when we talk about prediction of preeclampsia, we have several things. It is done mainly between eleven to fourteen weeks, and importantly, very important, the medical history. Is she chronically hypertensive? Is she a primary gravida? Does she have family history? Does she have um, uh, APLA or SLE? Okay. Does she have a previous history of preeclampsia? These are all risk, medical history-wise risk factors. Then the uterine artery pulsatility index. If it is raised, that means there is most more resistance in the uterine artery. So it's not a good thing. And if you have biochemical markers, that is like placental growth factor, Pap, A, there are many others. And this came in the last I N I. Okay. So. combination of all three there are softwares which calculate the risk calculation and this risk is for early onset preeclampsia okay 
So what they give you is a risk of early onset preeclampsia. If she's low risk, continue with routine care. But if she is high risk, then start low dose aspirin. They say 75 to 150 milligram before 16 weeks. It has to be started before 16 weeks to prevent eclampsia. Okay, especially severe uh, preeclampsia from happening because this is when the second wave of trophoblastic invasion will happen. This is how a uterine artery PI looks like, a uh, uterine artery Doppler looks like. Okay, there's another question in the paper on Doppler. I think some other subject. So you should know how Dopplers look like. I think many of you would have got it because you know how umbilical artery Dopplers look like. You know how uterine artery Dopplers look like. So this is a Doppler. Okay, next question. So, uh, just this is actually in continuation of the previous question. That's why I put them together. And pre-eclampsia, eclampsia is such an important topic. See, three questions directly in this paper from this topic. 34-year-old woman develops pre-eclampsia 28 weeks. She's very anxious and asks, why has this developed? Many many women do this. They come to us to the doctor and say, hey, why, why did I have to get this? Okay. So, you explain to her that there's a problem in the development of maternal fetal circulation in early pregnancy. What is the cause for this? Okay, now here again, there was a confusion between two. Okay, there were two choices of spinal arterioles. These were out. So, the, the there is basically poor extravillous trophoblastic invasion or deficient second wave of extravillous. So, this word is important. Extravillous trophoblastic invasion. And let me explain this. So, these are... So these are the syncytial trophoblastic cells outside and the cytotrophoblastic cells inside. And these are the anchoring villi. Remember the picture of the placenta? You have a lot of anchoring villi. And this picture is from Williams. Okay, so again, I will repeat. Williams is your standard book. Okay, and even in the INI, a lot of questions directly picked up word to word, line to line from Williams. This diagram also, what does it say? The cytotrophoblastic cells are some of them enter the placental bed and these are called as extravillous trophoblasts and they go and what do they do? They replace the endothelial lining of the vessels and cause them to expand, to nicely expand. Okay, and if they don't do that, so this is normal, if they don't do that, the spiral arterioles remain thick, they remain constricted, they remain with less vascularity and that is what leads to preeclampsia. Okay, so remember this word, extravillous Okay, again, this is a previous year question. Okay, what was asked, uh, I think two, three years back was in the first trimester. Okay, but here the question was a little twisted and they could have made it much simpler. They made it a little confusing. A primary at 12 weeks. So, she has come at 12 weeks and she wants to know the additional daily calorie requirements she would need to take. Is it 300 kilocalories throughout pregnancy? Is it 400 kilocalories in the second trimester or in the third trimester or 200 in the second trimester? So, remember, zero Okay, uh, I've gotten the next slide. Okay, so zero, around 350 and 450. So this is your correct answers. No additional calorie requirements in the first trimester, 350 in the second trimester and 450 in the third trimester. So with that, if you see, this becomes our best option. Okay, this also, many of you have marked this because yes, 350 kilocals is what ICMR recommends throughout pregnancy. Okay, but if you see Williams, it says in the first trimester, no additional calorie requirement is required. If we go by Williams, this is our more appropriate, correct answer. Okay, so what does Williams say? Williams says that the Institute of Medicine 2006 recommends no extra cals in the first, 340 in the second, 450 in the third. And what does ICMR say? 350 kilocals in so it's not mentioned trimester wise okay so this is why this is a better answer in my opinion okay okay again easy question on the second postnatal day where will the fundus of the uterus be will it be one finger below the umbilicus two finger three finger or four finger and the answer correct answer is two finger why because immediately after delivery where is the uterus it is just at the level of the umbilicus from the first day onwards it starts reducing in size or involuting at the rate of one finger breadth per day okay so, one finger breadth per day is how it reduces. So, on postpartum day 2, it will be around two finger breadth below the umbilicus. And by 10 days to 2 weeks, it becomes a pelvic. Becomes a, it doesn't, it's no longer palpable. It's a complete pelvic organ. Okay, next question. Now, 28, so there were, I think, 28 questions in all. We're almost at the end, but that's a huge number for ops and gynae. And ops and gynae is a very scoring topic. So, remember this. A 28-year-old woman is on her third postnatal day. A psychiatric consultation is sought in view of occasional crying episodes, fatigue, and lack of sleep. 
what is the likely diagnosis so here the clinching thing is third day and she has mild symptoms okay so this is classically puerperal blues okay many women in fact up to 70% of women will have puerperal blues okay 5 to 10% will have puerperal depression okay so the answer was puerperal blues so what is puerperal blues it is 70 to 80% postpartum depression is around 10% and postpartum psychosis is quite rare okay so it usually presents a classical third day was given it presents 2 to 4 days postpartum okay this can present up to a year postpartum also okay so the average duration it usually resolves in 10 days if it's persisting beyond 2 weeks that is when you start thinking of postpartum depression and this is what you'll see you'll see little mild symptoms here here the symptoms will be more severe and of course here it's completely different okay and here nothing needs to be done just a bit of counseling to the mother give her a bit of tender loving care and she will be all right okay next question a woman i this is actually a psm question but i put it here because it also ha comes under obs and gynae a woman living in an urban area in mp delivered at an institution ordered on counseling by an asha worker in 2018 what monetary benefit would she and the asha worker be entitled to under the janani suraksha yojana scheme but the gsy scheme basically encourages women to deliver at institutes and who helps the woman reach there or uh, counsels them is the asha worker and for that she gets an incentive okay now the uh, gsy scheme has been divided into um into basically a low performing states and high performing states so high performing states is madhya pradesh is a high performing state low performing states are the 10 states like bihar up uttarakhand those areas okay and a few others uh, but mp is a high performing state and what what this so this is from the gsy document of 2009 okay and what there they said was again urban area and rural area so she is saying an urban area the mother will get 600 rupees and the asha worker will get 200 rupees okay but here they revised the the incentive for the asha worker in 2018 and this is from that document okay what they said is the incentive is now 400 so for a woman staying in an urban area in a high performing state the woman will get 600 the asha worker will get 400 and that's the correct answer Okay, so this is something you have to learn. Um, it can get asked. I'm sure it's come in the past. It comes more from PSM, but yes, it had an obs and gynae component to it, so I put it here. Which hormone stimulates the male fetus to produce testosterone? Okay, and here the answer is HCG from the placenta. So Leydig cell differentiation and proliferation depends on placental HCG in the first and second trimesters of fetal life. And on fetal pituitary LH thereafter, so HCG actually has a LH comp has is similar to LH, and that is why it leads to testosterone production in the male fetus. Okay, so this was also a a one liner question, and I think most of you got this right. You are asked to prepare the discharge. I mean, this is the last question of a patient who has had a repair for a vesica vesico vaginal fistula. For how long will you ask her to abstain from sexual intercourse? and how long will she delay conception by so this is probably an obstetric vvf not one following hysterectomy okay because you you've been asked when will she uh, conceive again okay so these were the options given or roughly these i'm not sure about the permutations combinations to honestly speaking i have searched tilens i've searched novax i've searched williams gynae i've searched campbell urology okay and nowhere is it clearly given in fact tilens says it has to be individualized her um uh, her uh, uh, getting back to sexual life everything has to be individualized but i found this on google is a very recent article it says although the literature on the ideal time to resume sexual activity is scarce intercourse is usually prohibited for a period of 3 to 6 months however recent studies have shown that sexual activity can be resumed as early as 6 weeks so see here both the things are given so again a very doubtful controversial question i'm still searching for references if i get a better answer okay so looking at this article i think 6 weeks would have been a good option and conception again nothing is given when was her last cesarean because if it is an obstetric vvf it is mostly because of obstructed labor and for that a cesarean would have been done when was it done when was the repair done nothing has been given right so again it's sort of a blank um, weird uh, question but um, uh if you have comments please put them on the uh, on the comment section and i'll try to get back to you okay um i will get back to you i won't try i will get back to you but um this is a little um 
uh, uh, so six weeks would be the correct answer if we go by this article for abstinence for resumption of sexual activity. But uh, let me confirm. Let me look through more references and then I'll get back to you. Okay. Now, so that ends our discussion. So, I uh, don't think that the paper went bad or the paper uh, was difficult or tricky. Okay, so even if it is a failure, okay, um, uh, think of it as a, as a success. Okay, so all of us go through this. All of us have gone through this, and we still go through our struggles. Um, this is how life is. So, when in so in reality, failure is actually a part of success. Okay, so I, I wish you all the best for the result. I'm sure uh, you will all do very very well. and uh, looking forward to a good feedback from all of you in the comment section thank you so much you can subscribe to dogami please subscribe to dogami please subscribe to obj classes by dr rena you will i promise you you will find lots and lots of exciting content on these platforms thank you dogami